Aloha, and thank you for tuning in to Pacific Revival Center, where we say PRC is the place to be. Before we jump into the message, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on social media. I'm excited today because Bishop Kelsey has an awesome word for us. There are reflection questions throughout the message, so comment, like, and share as you watch. We are confident that you will receive a word today that will keep you empowered and strong in the Lord. We trust that you will hear a life-changing word to carry you through. All right, are you ready? Let's do it. Come on, say it's my time. It's my time for salvation. It's my time for healing. It's my time for blessing. It's my time for change. No weapon can stop me. No weapon can prosper. I'm superior to the forces of darkness. It's my appointed time. It's my set time. It's manifestation time. And now look at your neighbor and say, I am so blessed and so full of the anointing that no weapon formed against me could possibly prosper. This time, I win. This year, I win. This time, I win. Hallelujah. How far somebody, you may be seated in the house. Amen. So let me get into our message today. I might not get through it all today, but that's okay. You can ask me for the notes and I'll give them to you, okay? Why we fast? Because this is a time of year we always want to start off with a fast, and most of the churches are starting off with a fast, and everybody wants to start off with, which fast do they start off with? Anybody know? Say it. The Daniel fast. The 21-day fast. Amen. But I, I like to remind people, because I get into the details of the Bible, and I like to tell people, Daniel wasn't trying to fast for 21 days. Daniel said he was going to fast until he got an answer. Let me ask you a question there. How long are you willing to fast? It just happened to be 21 days because there was a battle going on in heaven when Daniel decided he wanted an answer to some questions from God. When you ask God for uh, 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 answers to questions, then Satan tries to stop the answer. Amen? And so I want to tell you today what I would like to talk about is moving from symbolic fasting, which we tend to do every year, you know, in and right, right around um, Easter, most of the churches will be fasting. They'll do what they call Lent. And we'll talk about that a little more. Am I right? How many have done Lent before? Had to do Lent. Okay. And so I used to always, why, why we got to give up some food on Friday? And I was okay with, the only thing I hated about Lent was where I was from, they used to tell you you can only eat fish on Friday. I had a problem with that. <laughs> I don't eat fish. <laughs> I don't eat fish, right? No, 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 no. Can we eat something else on Friday? <laughs> right? We want to move from symbolic fasting to operational fasting or living a fasted life. Living a fasted life. So stop looking for perfection in an unperfect world. Amen? Look for God. Let's look for what God wants to do. There's a whole lot of imperfections going on around us. Am I right? So let's look for God in the imperfections that are around us, amen, because God is in it. God is, everything we see that's going on today, God is in it, amen? He knows it's happening. He's not surprised, amen? It's just so when the battle reaches earth, I want you to think about this. When the battle reaches earth, it has already been fought in heaven. It has already been fought in heaven. When, the, when, when, when Daniel said he was reading the book of Jeremiah and he understood the 70 weeks. That, that meant 70 years that they were going to be in captivity. Now it's been 56 years, and he said, okay, Lord, you said 70 years, we're going to be, we're going, you're going to bring us back into the land. How is that going to happen? And he says, I set my face to fasting and said, I'm going to ask the Lord. Now, the last time he had asked the Lord a question, it was a little simple question he asked God. And as soon as he asked God, the angel was tapping him on the shoulder. Hey, Daniel, I'm here to answer your prayer. So you know he was thinking, let me ask God again. And he was looking, where the, where the angel at? He showed up right on time the last time. But Gabriel told me, he said, this time, the principality over Persia 
withstood me for 21 days. 21 days. See, so you have to be prepared to fast. Amen? Look at me and somebody say, are you prepared? We got to be prepared for what's coming in 2024. I was telling you saints last week, I said, those of you in the military, get ready. That's why we want to make sure we're praying for the military because we know what China's getting ready to do. China has put, he's put us on notice. Last week, he put us on notice. He's, the premier of China said it twice publicly. We taking Taiwan back. They said it. He said it. Now, I guarantee you, they're already planning it. They already got the plan. So let me talk to you today about why I fast, why I fast. Number one is to overcome. I fast to overcome. Joel, and I'll give you a few scriptures today. King James Version, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 says, Therefore, also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments. The kings was good at tearing their clothes up. Every time something would happen, the king would tear his clothes, right? Rend his clothes. It was a sign of, I'm really upset about this. Amen. What do you do when you get really upset? Let me ask you that question. He says, rend your heart, not your garments. I don't tear my clothes up. How about you? <laughs> my clothes, I, I don't like to keep having to buy clothes. So I don't tear, just rip them up. Amen. It says, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and of great kindness. And, I, and he's proven that to me in my life. And repent, repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom, bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. And give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among their people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity for his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathens. He says, if you'll just fast and turn to me, then I will intercede for you. And that's what we have to do. The Bible says that in the book of Isaiah, it says, Jesus looked down and marveled. It said, the Lord looked down and marveled. There's no intercessor. There's no one praying for things to change. And he says, therefore, I'm going to have to become the intercessor myself. You know, he, Jesus came just to be the intercessor for you and I. Number two, to strengthen myself for the task ahead. Amen? To strengthen myself for the task ahead. Are you strengthening yourself? Acts chapter 14, verse 23. And when they had, talking about Paul and Barnabas, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with, with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They prayed and fasted and said, now we're going to commit. We ordain you. We got you ready. We're getting ready to leave. We're going to leave you in charge. But before they did that, they fasted and prayed about what they were doing. They strengthened themselves for what they were getting ready to do. Amen? And let me read Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 to 23 for you. This is in the NIV. It says, there, there by the... Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone 
who looks to him. But his anger is among, against all who forsake him. So we fasted, and we petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. This is when Nehemiah is getting ready to go back. Nehemiah is the king's, uh, what we would call, uh, chief executive, executive officer. And he's going to go back. He's asked the king for permission to go back and rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. And he's fulfilling what Daniel was praying for. See, Daniel's been praying and fasting. But now Nehemiah is one of the ones that's having to do the work of what Daniel was praying for. Okay, you ready to send the people back? The people are going back to the land. And now the wall needs to be rebuilt for protection. And Daniel's got permission from the king to get supplies and everything to go back. But you know when you're going back, what's going to happen? You go along the, those roads are dangerous. They said that road, even going from um, Jericho to Jerusalem, is dangerous even right now. It's still a dangerous road. You still got thieves that will rob you along that road. You, anybody know of any roads you could take in your city that you say is dangerous? <laughs> right? You've got to be careful. You want a pistol if you're going down that road? Amen. That's the way it was. Amen. But he said, but because I had told him what God is going to do, I felt ashamed to ask him for a, a legion of soldiers to go with us to protect us because I was telling him how great is our God he said so what did we do we fasted and we prayed and we asked God about the situation Lord protect us along this road protect us so that nothing bad happens to us along this road amen Esther I like Esther I like the way Esther fasted also and she proclaimed a fast see you have the authority tell somebody you have authority to proclaim a fast in your household we're going to fast and pray about this. What do you fast and pray about? I want you to. And you know, when you read in the New Testament, when it talks about fasting and praying, they usually assume that when it says pray, that you're going to fast also. That you're going to fast along with praying. Amen. Esther chapter 4 verse 16 says, and what Esther is going through, she's been put in a position. I, I tell people now, when we take positions now in our government, we choose those positions. Am I right? No one's making us take the position. They were put in positions because I chose you. The king chose you. You may not have wanted to be in that position, but you had no choice. You came here as a slave, and we put you in this position. Esther was made queen, and she's queen now of Persia. But just because she queen, she's queen doesn't mean she has all power. She's queen, but even though she's queen, you do not approach the king unless he calls for you. Think about that. You do not, no one approaches the king unless he sends for you. Now the king lived a sheltered life, didn't he? He lived a sheltered life. And she, and now the children of Israel are, are threatened, what's his name? Haman is threatened to have them all slaughtered. Every one of them killed. And Mordecai says, hey, it may be the reason you're queen. God put you on the throne for such a time as this. You're the answer. When problems arise, do you see yourself as part of the problem? Or are you the answer? God has let me know. He says, you know, the spirit of God is in you, so you're always the answer. You're always the answer. You have the knowledge of God in you. You're always the answer. You're not the problem. Tell somebody, say, you're not the problem. Well, I don't know. I've never seen what's going on in your marriage, so I can't really say that. I have to sit down and talk to you for a little bit before I, before I proclaim that. You just might be the problem. Amen. But God has the answer. I want to tell you, God has the answer. Amen. So Esther says this to her uncle Mordecai. She says, go gather together all the Jews which are in Susa and fast for me and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. She said, don't eat nothing. <laughs> Daniel, when he fasted, he said, I'm just not going to eat any sweet. I'm not, going, I'm not going to Outback. I'm not going to drink any wine. I'm not eating none of that stuff. I'm, going, I'm just going to eat with bare essentials, water, whatever. You know, I'm just, I'm going, whatever it takes for me to survive, I'm going to, that's all I'm going to eat. And I, I'm telling you again, he only thought it was going to be one day. He, he expected God to be right there. And it's, you don't have to miss another meal, Daniel. I'm right here to answer your prayer. Is that the way you fast? Amen. God don't show up this afternoon. You gave up the fast. Amen. God is going to honor what you tell him you're going to do. He wants to bless your words, the words that come out of your mouth. He wants to put power behind the words that you speak. Amen? So she speaks 
three days. Now, I know it was some of the saints out there upset. Don't eat what? Do you know what I had planning for tomorrow? And you said, don't eat nothing for three days, night or day? She had to clarify that, night or day. She said, just three days, but you didn't say night. Amen? See, there's some out there that said, but you didn't say night. They think like me, amen? And I will, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Isn't that something? <laughs> then I'll go to the king, although it's against the law, to go to him without him summoning me. She said, he hasn't summoned me. I can't go to him. And she's queen. She's queen. After that, she becomes one of the most powerful people in the Persian government because of that. And all of that was designed by God's purpose and God's plan. Because the reason Esther was put on the throne is because Vashi, the king's other wife, he had put her away. Because she refused to come when he summoned her. She refused to come. And God, all part of God's plan, because God says, I need Esther to raise Azurzi's son. Because Azurzi's son was going to be the one that was going to sign the decree for the children of Israel to go back to, the, to their land. And when Nehemiah came and asked for resources, he was asking Xerxes' son, who was raised by Queen Esther. So he, under, he believed in God. He understood who, who God was. All of that in God's plan and God's purpose, but we must, must prepare ourselves for what God wants to do. Number three, this is my last one, to intercede for God's purpose. Somebody say, not my will, but thy will be done. God wants us to intercede for his purpose. Not my purpose. I can look at TV and see all the stuff that's going on, and, and what I'm thinking should happen may not be part of God's plan. May not be part of God's plan. So I need to be prepared for God's will, not my will. Amen? Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 11 says, so it, was, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord, oh, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God. Look at how he prays. I like the way he prays. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. You know what prayer Nehemiah is praying? He's praying the prayer that Solomon asked to be prayed over in the book of First um, Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter seven. He says, "If my people." find themselves in any situation, find themselves in another land because they sin, if they will look to you, turn toward this place and pray, then Lord, hear their prayers and heal their land. And the Lord answers Solomon and says, if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then my ears would be open and my, eye, my eyes would be open and my ears attentive and I will hear their prayer. And that's the prayer he's praying. He's, he's not making up a prayer. He's praying a prayer that's already been written. It says, now day and night, he says, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept thy commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances, which you commanded your servants, Moses. Remember, I prayed the word that you commanded your servant, Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. 
See, that place over there, that little bitty place over there that everybody's ready to fight over and everybody's in an uproar over right now today, if you watch the news, that little bitty piece of land over there that's not even the size of our state that everybody's fighting over, God says, my name is there. That's the place I call, chose for my name. And he brought the people back. He brought them back to that land. After 2,500 years, he brought them back to it because somebody was praying. Somebody was praying. Somebody was humbling themselves, amen? He says, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you are cast off, to, to, I will yet gather them from there and bring them to the place which I've chosen as a dwelling place for my name. And these are your, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed with your great power. And by your strong hand, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. If we got anybody in here who desires to fear God's name? Now, we're reading this out of the King James Version, and that's why I like to read other versions also, because that word for fear is not really fear. That's reverence. Desire to love his name. I love the name of the Lord. Amen. Uh, I'm like David. He says, the name of the Lord, it's a strong tower. The righteous run in and they're saved. Amen. I've had, how many times have you, I got a question for you. How many times have you had to run into that name? Lord, save me. (laughs) And he showed up. (laughs) He actually did it. (laughs) Amen. I got some testimonies on how he did it. Amen. He says, I pray, he says, your servant, I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He's talking about the king. For I was the king's cupbearer. A cupbearer is not somebody, we, we see it on TV, on the little cartoons. The cupbearer just sitting there tasting the king's food so make sure it wasn't poison. Oh, that, he, wasn't, he was the executive officer. You don't get to get in and see the king unless you go through him. Amen? That's the same way with our government. We have a, a, a chief of staff. Am I right? Chief of staff what they call them. Even in our military, you have a, they have a chief of staff. You, 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 been, you don't just show up at the captain or the commanders, your commanding officers. How many of you do that? I, I'm just going to knock on his door. I'm, I'm going to bypass the chief of staff or the executive officer. I'm just going to bypass him. Amen? The executive officer has power, doesn't he? I know my, my executive officer delivered me out of some stuff. I was supposed to see the captain, and he told me because he says, I'm going to just dismiss this right now because if you see the captain, he's going he gonna to throw the book at you. Amen. He's going to throw the book at you. So I'm just going to dismiss it right there. He just used his power. I remember I came in and he just balled the, the accusation up and threw it at me. He said, get out of my office. <laughs> right? Amen. They have power. He said, I was the king's cupbearer. Number four. I thought number three was the last one, but we got number four, okay? Number four is, we don't fast because it makes us righteous with God. I want you to get that. We do not fast because it makes us righteous with God. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14, New King James Version, says, says it this way. It says, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Get that now. And despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, let me define a Pharisee for you. Somebody say, attorney. Okay. Pharisee. They were attorneys. Okay. We didn't think they were priests, but no, they weren't. They were attorneys. And they, and they, were, they were picked the Supreme Court or the chief priest from one of the Pharisees' political party. Or the, what was the other one? Sadducees political parties. All of them were attorneys. They were doctors of the law. <laughs> they had law degrees, amen? It says, one of Pharisee, but you know, Jesus seemed to really be on the Pharisees. He wasn't on the Sadducees that much, was he? He's always, he was always comparing the Pharisees, right? He says, and he spoke the parable to some of them. He says, two men went up to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors were hated. IRS. How many got any friends that work for IRS? My sister used to work for IRS. You know, used to be a tax collector. 
It was strange to me how she got the job. Amen. That's another story. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. I like the way that says it. It says the Pharisee prayed and stood with himself. He was praying with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. He just lumped the tax collector in there with all adulterers, extortioners. Isn't that something? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who, is hum who humbles himself will be exalted. He says the tax collector's prayer was accepted. But the Pharisee's prayer, he said, I, mean, I ain't got no time. God said, I ain't got no time for that. I want you to get this. Fasting should be designed for your calling. Not just because everybody says you're supposed to fast. The Bible says you're supposed to fast. In their law, in the, in, 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 in the, the missioner, they, they believe that you, the Pharisees believe you're supposed to fast. He went, I fast twice a week. I fast twice a week. I tithe on everything I get. You know, Jesus said about them, he said, you straineth at a gnat. What, what he meant was, before you drink anything, you put a screen over it and strain it to make sure it's not even a gnat in because it can make me unclean. He said, y'all taking this a little too far. We should fast based on our calling, Amen. I want you to see what that means. It's Jennifer. She's back in the room. Can Minister Jen, can you come on up with me? And we'll help close. She can help me close this out. We fast. Our fasting should be designed for our calling, not just because. Not just because. In other words, we don't do Lent. We don't do Lent. Anybody know what Lent is? Y'all know what Lent is, don't you? Oh, see, some of the Pentecostals don't do Lent. Lent is, you're going to do for 40 days before Passover or before Resurrection Sunday, you're supposed to do Lent and you're supposed to give up something. I know my sister will always say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to give up coffee, you know, and they're going to fast on coffee on Fridays. That's Lent. Amen. You did Lent? No, we didn't. You didn't do Lent? I, no. I did Lent because I was in Catholic Church, so I did Lent. No, we was Baptist. My mother didn't even consider Lent. <laughs> three, uh, three main things people focus on doing Lent are supposed to be Prayer, fasting, abstaining from something to reduce distractions and focus more on God and giving to, uh, giving to charity, right? And prayer during Lent fo focuses our needs on God's forgiveness. We're supposed to do that during Lent. And it also is about repenting or turning away from sin and receiving God. But most people don't do, they don't, they don't even repent on anything. They just say, I'm going to give up something that I'm eating. I'm going to give up coffee. I'm going to give up hamburgers this week. Amen? And that's how they do, they do Lent. And, and, and I'm talking about experience in Catholic Church. They don't put a lot of burdens on you when you're doing that. Oh, you're going to give that up? That's good. God bless that. But that's not really helping me. So I was talking about, I, when we talk about fasting, and I asked you a question yesterday. What was it? You asked, how does the military fast? How does the military fast? How many, how many we have people in the military. Does the military fast? Yes. No, they fast. <laughs> we're going to show, I'm going to show you that today. We're going we're gonna to see that today. The military fast. They made me fast. <laughs> see, you're, you're thinking fasting is giving up food. But we're going to see what fasting really is today. Amen? Don't tell us how the military fast. So when Bishop asked the question, I said fast or abstaining. So what I gave him was a scenario. Abstain. Abstaining. <laughs> Do y'all abstain? <laughs> okay. So I'll I get you in a minute. <laughs> so I gave him the understanding about deployment. Whenever we deploy, we have to, uh, in order for us to deploy, we actually leave from where we're coming from, but we have to go through a certain type of training. And the, the, I said the operational piece of it requires that a soldier has to be mentally and physically fit. Not only that, had to be able to make uh, decisions while they're on front. So what I did say too is the first part was I said, we have to, we have to adapt to a work schedule. 
Sometimes it's 24 to 72 hours, and we have like 30 to 40 minutes of sleep in between. And then I said, as far as that, we have the operational part, and then we have the physical part. And so he responded. He said, well, this isn't like Lent. I said, well, it's not really like Lent. So what I gave the next scenario to him was, was that as military soldiers, we have to be physically and mentally adapted and prepared. We also have particular training that we receive, but also physical fitness. In order for you to have the physical fitness, it requires you to sole purpose is that you're able to carry your equipment, carry uh, uh, someone else, and carry yourself. I said, along with that, too, <laughs> I said, along with that, too, the sole purpose is that, that we are there to do number one, that we have to protect the base, protect our leadership, and then protect ourselves. So along with that, the physicalness is why we have the physical fitness test every six months. It prepares us to be able to, one, to work in those conditions, to adapt to those conditions, and be able to, like I was said, thrive in those conditions mentally, physically, and also be aware of your surroundings, be acute of it. I said, now, for me, for, for 25 years, I weighed 150 pounds. Because if I look like I was fat, oh, yes, I'm going to have to fast <laughs> to do that. <laughs> and we know we went into the sauna to try to get that plastic on us to knock out some of that water weight. I said, but then now, plan, right? now that I'm retired, I'm retired, those, those things I still do. I do not, it prepared me to also that there's, a, there's food that I do not conceive. There's also unhealthy relationships I, I'm not involved in. It keeps me from gluttony. It keeps me from alcoholism. But also now, even though I'm retired, I don't look like I weigh 250 pounds. I don't like I weigh 150. But I have a very healthy lifestyle instead of an unhealthy lifestyle. So I am taking those tools, and I am still abstaining from certain things, so from certain areas in, in, in anything. So that's what's considered as fasting. And you were saying, go back to that, because I don't know. We didn't do that in the Navy. Um, you say you'll go in for 30 minutes of sleep and? 30 hours. 30 hours, of, you go 30 hours without sleeping? Or? Without sleep, so with me do, do y'all do that? Then no, we'll do that, huh? <laughs> well, see, for me, medical-wise, I have, I'm part of a combat support hospital, field hospital. So I'm the surge, I'm the peri-op NCOIC. So, hoorah. <laughs> so, so I have four ORs, and I have four uh, S's, and then I have, whenever you go in, all of those departments fall into me as NCO. So they call it the PLX. So I would stand in front of about 75 NCOs and all the master sergeants back there doing like this, you good. But because I was in the position as a staff sergeant, I was over all of those people. And so we have to be prepared to take casualties up to 72 hours. So my soldiers, they had to stay up 72 hours. 72 hours. Had so what are you fasting on, sleep? <laughs> so I told you I fast, didn't I? And, and, and see, I know we are fast because I used to be on a ship that carried a troop carrier, carried Marines with my last ship. And when we were getting ready to drop you guys off in Mindanao for hot weather training, the gunny would go through, I would hear him say, go through all y'all, what do you call them bags y'all carry, the rough shacks? Rough and he said, get the gee dunk out of there. Y'all don't know what gee dunk is. Gee dunk is candy. candy. Take all that sweet stuff that I just sold to them out of my ship store. <laughs> get it all out them bags. And he would, he would search their bags and make sure he got it all out of there. Y'all not getting to eat none of that while y'all out here in this jungle. Amen. And he would do it for your benefit, wouldn't he? You, you know, because you used to be one of those. <laughs> Doing it for their benefit. And they would be upset. I just spent my money on this. You know, your little E3 and all that. You just spent your money on this and he make you throw it away. Throw it away. Get it all out of there. Get it out. Get the stuff out of your life that you need to get out right now, right? So that you can do the job that you're called to do. So that you can be prepared for the job that you're called to do. So I like what you said. And you know, the, uh, some of my, uh, the Army guys in here tell you also, I, I was surprised to hear that. When they, they stand watch, in the Navy, we stand 24 hours. We have duty for 24 hours a day, once a week. But we go to sleep. Oh, no. Tell them, y'all don't go to sleep, huh? If, if we go to sleep, that's a violation of UCMJ, and you would be shackled and put in jail. They, they to, even though y'all not at war. We are, are made, our, our mental security is to protect that fob and to protect our leaders and protect the people that are there. And to act like you're doing it, even though ain't nothing going on, right? Oh, we, yeah, we have to. Yeah, we have to. But they stay up for 24 hours. I said, that just sounds ridiculous. Can't somebody relieve you and you go to sleep? Because y'all get the next day off, right? We get the next person come on, relieves us after 24 hours. He has 24 hours. So somebody right now somewhere standing for 24 hours, not sleeping. 
So right. I tell you, that's the way they fast. And this is what I want you to get, because fasting has to be operational. Fasting has to be operational. And this is going on how long? This is going on continuously from Monday. It's seven days, 365. 365. We should live a life of fasting. There's some things that we should just be doing that we say, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm fasting. Something else you said, I'll, close, I'll get very close with this. You told me, you said, when you're fast, when you're deployed for maybe two years, you're in a whole new mindset of what you're doing for your lifestyle completely change. Yes, it does. Because while you're in that, uh, where you are, like Jabez, you know, expand my territory. Your territory doesn't include the home life you have here. So you make a complete readjustment to be adaptable to what you see when you wake up. You're not going to be able to sleep in your comfortable bed. You're uh, not going to be able to talk to your children as you should. You know, if you're married, depending on the dual military, you won't be able to have these things that you're accustomed to right now. And therefore, you have to, you know, you have to learn how to live that lifestyle. And then when you come back, you have to be reintegrated back into your home life. That's why a lot of our military men and women, we have a difficult time at transition. And we learned a lot of tools when we are out there when it's just me, you, and my battle buddy. You know, some tactics. And so some of us still have those tactical mentality based on being even in an even soft environment here. And that's yeah, why you behavior can't take it home what you can. You can't take it home. This, this ain't the military, right? Let me read this last scripture to you. Thanks, thanks Minister Jen. We'll get ready to close. It's in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 33 through Verse 3 to 9, I'm reading the uh, New King James Version. He says, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? Because God's not interested in you afflicting your soul. Amen? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. Isn't that something? You find pleasure. And exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast, you fast for strife and debate. Strife and debate. Get that one now. And to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. In other words, God says, I'm changing the way you fast. Is, is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Rhetorical question, no. Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast? And an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen for you? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo heavy burdens. Isn't that something? To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. And that you break every yoke. Uh, uh, that's, that, that, tell somebody, say, that takes training. <laughs> that takes training, doesn't it? Because I don't wake up every day just thinking, oh, I want to go break some yokes. I want to go undo some heavy burdens. But if you ask me to give up coffee, I'll do that. If you ask me to give up meat this week, well, if you ask me to give up vegetables this week, I'll do that. Amen. When, when we do our fast and we say no, we have the one week where we say no meat. I remember me and Elder Terry, we come home and we look at what's for dinner and we just say, I'm going to bed. Because <laughs> ain't no meat. Pastor Drew Seller, ain't no problem. It's Chinese food. You can give <laughs> all the vegetables around. They ain't, they ain't having no problem that week at all. Amen. I just, I'm just going to go to bed, wait for tomorrow so I can get up and eat me some bacon or something. Right? But he says, this is the fast that I want you to. I hope they, they got some pictures up here I wanted to show you of uh, what we've been doing in Kenya, a couple of things. They've, did they show them up there already? I don't know what's going on behind me. Show me the after picture. This is one of the hallways in the school over in Kenya. Wow, they did all that. Well, I can't wait to show you all the work that the, the $3,000 that we raised did. Over there in Kenya, three thousand dollars. All this way, they remodeled the whole building. Look at the rest. Pa Pastor Drusilla can really tell you about the restrooms, because they had to use them because they had to stay there before it looked like before it looked like that. Amen. Before it looked like that. 
I, like I tell you, I said, our women are Marines. <laughs> we got the Marines here. I'm Navy and Marines. Navy, we go find a hotel. <laughs> Army and Marines, they said, no, we just going to camp right here. Am I right? <laughs> we going to camp right here. We, we going to make our own toilet. Amen. <laughs> I ain't into that. I ain't into making my own toilet. <laughs> he says, let me read that again. Is this not the fast that I've chosen for you? This is the fast God wants us doing. To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst and the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Stand to your feet as we get very close. See, that's the fast we want to do this month. I would like to ask us as a church to plug in. We're going to break some yokes. And we're already breaking some yokes right over there in, in, in Kenya and in Zambia. And I really, it's just really on our heart right now. And because... We're, we're over Victory Churches USA. We're, that's the heart of Victory Churches USA. Pastor Albert White, we're all putting it together right now. Pastor Drusilla just sent a check for some more monies that came in. I know I posted something on Facebook. Some of you guys saw it, but when they, we, they were, we was at one of the services in Kenya, and I'm getting replies already hit back from Facebook, and my little sister said, I'm going next time. I'm going with y'all the next time, Amen. And I know she's going to be raising something for it from her organizations. See, but we, we're putting a plan together to break some yokes. This is a fast that God wants to accept. I may believe that. If you don't, accept it because the word of God says it. The word of God says it. And we're not asking for much. We're not asking for much. We, we, we ask for $30, $30, $30. You know why $30? Because we can send a kid to school for a whole, year, for a whole month for $30. For $30, $300, we can send a kid to school for a year. We can subsidize. Some of the kids are going to pay to go to school, but uh, some of them we're going to subsidize to go to school. And it's boarding school. They're going to not just go to school, they'll be living at the school. But $300 a year, that's not a lot, is it? Pastor Buller was taking offering last night, and what did he say? He said, if you give up what? If, if you give up the, uh, the, uh, the big gulp. One um, seven up big gulp. Big gulp. Uh huh. That's $189 a year. <laughs> <laughs> he said, so he said, you got the money. <laughs> he said, the money, the problem is not the money. The problem is you. <laughs> and I love that, right? He said, no, he's right. I can think of some things if I just give up one time, right? Or two or three times. If we give up two or three times, we could get $300. Am I right? We know what that is, don't we? <laughs> it's not that hard. But it's what God accepts from us, Amen. It's what he wants from us. And, and last, one last scripture, and I'll close, okay? Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. And the Lord says this about my fasting. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. You go around and tell everybody what you did, you got your reward, amen? He says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Will reward you openly. That's how we fast, amen? That's how, now, this is, this is going to be a new way to fast for some of us, right? So let's get used to it. Let's say, say it with me. Say operational fasting. Operational fasting. Not symbolic fasting, but operational fasting. 
It's like they do in the military. They fast. Sometimes they have to fast for two years. You're going to be out there for two years eating MREs. How many, you know, how many like MREs? I like it. Number nine. <laughs> Number nine. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> we would go to general quarters training for maybe a whole 24 hours, and we eat box lunches. My favorite food. <laughs> no problem with bologna sandwiches. I was good to go. <laughs> Amen. 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 Let's give God a hand praise for that word. You know, I'm so glad that I can come to a house where we get fed some meat. Now, today, uh, God just revealed some some wonderful, um, just new information for me about fasting. And I'm just so grateful. So grateful. Thank you, Bishop, for the word. Thank you for the revelation on fasting. And one thing that he shared was that uh, fasting should be designed based on our calling, not just because. And the difference between operational fasting, I'm so thankful for that word. Now, this is the time for us to kind of reflect on our personal, our personal walk. So let us pray together. And as we're praying, if you want to come up again, please come on up and we'll stand in agreement with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord God, that we can fast and pray, Father, not just because we want to be righteous. Matter of fact, it's because we know that in our fasting, in our prayer, you are doing something as a, uh, as a means and, and because we have hum, um, made sure that we've humbled ourselves to, 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 to be in agreement to do that thing, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for the weapon of fasting and prayer, God. We thank you, Lord God, that you hear our prayers, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you stand in agreement with everything that it is that you want to be done, every purpose and plan that you have for our lives, oh God. And the only thing you ask is for us to pray and seek your face, God, and sometimes turn down our plate, Father, as we wait on you, Father. So I pray for everyone in this congregation that you would strengthen us, that you would bless us, Lord God, and help us to understand the power behind fasting and prayer, Father. And not just the power behind fasting and prayer, Lord God, but the power behind putting our hands to the plow and doing what it is that you have called us to do individually and collectively. And in Jesus' name, we give you honor, we give you praise and glory, and we say amen. Mahalo for tuning in with Pacific Revival Center. If this message touched your spirit, make sure to subscribe and follow us on all our social media accounts to connect with our online family. If you're already a follower, share our content with your family and friends. And if you'd like to support the ministry, click Give Now below. Our mission is to train, equip, and send out armies of believers to minister the gospel to all nations. And together, we can send the love of Christ to all corners of the world. We'll see you next week here at PRC, the place to be.